When we're talking about food resilience and sustainable land management, it's important to recognise that we still have so much to learn from First Nations communities. We want to pay respects to the rightful owners of this land, the Yagra and Turbal peoples. Sovereignty was never ceded. Our food systems in Australia are incredibly precarious. One cyclone or flood or major disruption mean that supermarket shelves end up empty real quick. The mere act of growing nutritious food and then giving it away for free is quite rebellious and subversive. Just because the council or the government says that you can't do something doesn't mean they're right and doesn't mean you should just roll over and agree to that. This little spot's interesting. It might be alright down there, it's just that if there's water, runoff is likely to come down here and there could be like oil spills and stuff. Growing Forward is a social movement, so it's about trying to take back government land that has been misused or abandoned. But I feel really good about this place. Yeah, it feels like it's desperate for like a community garden. Yeah. yeah. As like everything else except for that, so. We're going into these areas and growing food, and we're asking permission from First Nations communities, but not necessarily from the government. Are these good room? Yeah. They're better cooked. Another thing that's played into it is COVID-19 and the climate situation, because those things have kind of created this pocket where people are like, actually, we really do need food. They yeah. Self yeah, they're self-seeded. Really? So these are all self-seeded? That's when yeah. you know... Garden's oh, going well. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> If I can pass you yep. some things... And we'll These localised food production projects are actually about challenging the corporate dominance of our food supply systems and asserting that everyone should have access to nutritious, fresh food. Today, people have been coming to collect their plants for the Verge plant out. If someone comes, just grab their name and their number. So one tray, but they can't mix and match, so they just have to pick a tray. They can have one citrus and one other tree which is either pawpaw, papaya, guava, or if they come back on Saturday, we'll have mulberry. I feel like especially after the coronavirus, people have really started to question their food security. So many people are coming down and the people who are collecting are quite excited to get more, more trees. When Jono's initiative came through, it was like, you know, mana from heaven. And this, I suppose, this is mana for any gardener. Look at that. Wow, beautiful. And so it's that education that growing food doesn't have to be time consuming, that you can just put it in and once it's established, it can be just there growing for you as free food. Everyone can get a Greek basil. Um, so more sambung lettuce. Were we short? Oh, that looks so nice. Mm. So good. What a pack. 12, 8, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yay. Mm. Oh, this is great. Oh, yeah. I'm so happy. Yeah, it's, been, it's actually a really nice afternoon. Like, so many people have dropped by and had conversations, and we had a little working bee at the same time. When it smells sweet um, and it doesn't smell all like kind of foresty, that's when you know that it, there's mycelium that's kind of started to, to work. Mycelium is a network. Um, that helps transport different nutrients and it's basically the network that fruits mushrooms. The biggest thing I think with gorilla gardening is that you want to get in and get out as soon as possible. So you want to establish a really well-functioning garden in a very short period of time. If you go in and set something up in two days and you have like this fully formed functioning garden, People don't even realise until, you know, they come back and see it blooming. This garden has a specific purpose in being a form of resistance and standing in solidarity with refugees. And just putting them out about five centimetres, so from here to here. Yeah. We're trying to get more and more people involved in learning about growing food, learning about community, and learning about how to be more resilient in the face of pandemics and climate-induced natural disaster. and know how detrimental clearing the agricultural systems are in the environment and how we need to 
be less reliant on those systems and more reliant on people actually creating their own food that's, you know, mm. sustainable and supports the local community. start of COVID, all the shops ran out of seeds. We realised pretty quickly that a seedling hub is a good way of getting stuff out there. It just meant there's an opportunity there for people to grow their own food. Some lavender, we've got chilies which aren't ready to pot up yet. Let's put a few more leaves out. Everybody loves chilies. No, mm. it's, I just grow what I grow for my own garden. So whatever I'm growing for myself, I kind of put double in and put some in here. If you have abundance of something, it's good to share it. It does kind of look like it's going to rain again. It's a bit of an art, like you need to know when to harvest them. And there's stuff I'm just learning now. Like I had no idea before how to seed save. Ah! Oh. Oh no, don't want to go in there. Often you'll have lots of abundance in the garden, you'll have lots of seeds, but you won't know what to do with them. You can't save them all. I think it gives a space for people to be able to give back. During times of crisis, food community projects like this one are really important in terms of community resilience. The resilience is this idea that a uh, system bounces back to either where it was or improves where it was before the event and can handle those shocks. We want people to actually reclaim the public space. We want them to take more control over the areas of land in front of their house and essentially practice a form of commoning. So we're down on Boundary Street in West End this morning, planting up one of many verge gardens around the neighborhood. I think here we're planting a couple of fruit trees and then a whole bunch of smaller edibles and herbs. The whole point here is just bringing people together and it's really cool. A couple of families have come down to help with this front yard and it's nice to see some of the kids are out getting their hands dirty as well. When we got the message that it was today, we realised that that's when we're celebrating her birthday. So we thought it was perfect we would combine the two. It's just fun. It's just fun. Yeah. And I like to eat so it makes it even more fun. You do like to. <laughs> Common in is where they're public spaces, they're shared spaces, but you don't leave it up to council or some abstract government entity to decide what happens there. It's actually local residents talking to one another and deciding how they want that space to be used. I mean, once you close off the street, there's so much potential, hey? Yeah. yeah. So and it's much. it's going to be when we actually get to know people. Giving people more agency over public space increases civic engagement and connection and means that people feel more passionate about their local neighbourhood and will get more involved in those bigger discussions about what kind of community we want to live in. One plant produces like so many seeds, like thousands of seeds. You just save them. What does it mean to actually fairly share produce? Like how does that get distributed? I think for me it means to like completely give it away. It's so good for your mental health to like plant something in the ground and then you come back like a few days later and you can see like the progression. I'm obsessed with mycelium because it reminds us that we're connected, you know, and you can't see all of the webs of interconnection, you know, it's invisible. The mycelium that's kind of channeling everywhere that we can't see right now is that perfect reminder that we actually can't exist without each other. Each of these projects obviously has a lot of value in and of themselves, but the collective impact of all these projects added up together is significantly magnified. With multiple urban farms, multiple seedling hubs, dozens of verge gardens, it all adds up to create a broader cultural shift. Everyone in the neighbourhood is living within a couple hundred metres of one of these projects, and you kind of can't move through the neighbourhood without seeing and interacting with one of these projects. It's really something that's like brought the community in and also has inspired other people.
Having a diversity of places with a diversity of crops through a diversity of people through a diversity of channels, you know, by definition that's where the resilience comes in. Yeah. Sometimes we're, we're buying food that's coming from overseas or from long distances away, so it's beautiful that we can start closing that gap a little bit and people to start developing that relationship with their food. We want to challenge state ownership of land. It's not just about like growing food, it's a bit more than that really. Mm. Yeah. It's very deliberately about challenging the power of the nation state and actually building up community capacity to the point where we can render some of those government institutions irrelevant. Their garden is kind of like a symbol as well as a form of mutual aid, but it's a symbol of resistance and it's a symbol of hope. What's radical about these gardens is that we're not asking for permission. We're just going out and doing it. I think living in Brisbane, you just gotta accept bush turkeys.